Hey guys, it's Bob and I like to make stuff. Welcome to this episode of Brain Pick. And uh, really excited. We got Izzy Swan here tonight. Say hi, Izzy. Hey, everybody. And we got a lot of questions piling up already. Um, like normal, if you have a question for both of us, just put both at the beginning. Or if it's for one of us, just put the name. That way we can get it to you know get you the right answer. And I have to say, before we get started, that I was blown away by your little shirt folding thing that you did the other day. <laughs> it was awesome. Thanks, man. It was fun. I, uh, Thursday night, I was thinking about that. My kids were complaining about laundry, and I was just like, all right, I got to do something about this. So um, I'd seen the flip fold things before, and um, I thought it would be really cool if it was mechanized. So they would be more interested in using it. And that was So I went out Friday morning and beat one out. So. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, I, I might have just been halfway interested in it because I do all of our laundry, so maybe, you know, maybe it was just uh, <laughs> looking for a way to make that faster for me. But I also, and we can talk about this later, but I also don't understand how you can go out in the morning and, with an idea like that and get it completely done. And I know that you probably can't explain how you do that, but it seems crazy to me that you're able to produce these like machines in, in such a short amount of time. But. Yeah, I, I don't know how to explain that one. I just I see I see how things work, and I, I know how to put them together. So I, I just um, it's a talent. I it's a, a talent I've always had, I suppose. Nice. Okay. Well, let's get to some of the questions. Um, all right, we got one from Phil here. It says, "Izzy, between your family and your woodwork." I shouldn't think that you have much time left for anything, but do you have any other hobbies or interests? <laughs> yes, too many, way too many. Um, besides the woodworking, I do a lot of metalwork. Uh, I do I design furniture, still design furniture for a couple of companies. Um, I try to fish when I can, <laughs> and I read a lot. That's my other passion is reading. If I'm not, if I have any free time at all, I'm reading something. So. Nice. What kind of stuff do you read? Uh, stuff that would bore the hell out of most people. <laughs> <laughs> um, technical. I, I read a lot of technical. Um, uh, I, like, I read technical manuscripts. I like to. Uh, I like to learn about different. You know, if I'm using a wood glue, I'll, I'll read about the properties of it and what it's good for. And do the same with finishes. Um, lately, I've been. I just downloaded Matthias Wandel's gear template generator, which I should have done a year ago. That thing is awesome. So I've been learning a lot about gears lately and how they work and that sort of thing. So, and that's I mean that's awesome. That's like pre-research because that's the stuff that you can pull from when you go on a Friday morning and you need to produce something. You've got that finish knowledge and gear knowledge and all that stuff's already preloaded. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, we got another one here. When I first started, I guess this is for you, when I first started uh, following you, you told us that you had sold your business and were now pursuing your hobby. However, with the new workshop, it appears you have thrown yourself back into the business side. Was that through boredom or necessity? Boredom. <laughs> um, and I'm actually, if you, if you guys notice, I'm back at the old, I'm back in the garage working. Uh, initially, I came back to the garage just because producing at the shop, producing videos at the shop was next to impossible. Um, we got busy right away. Steve was building furniture and staying really busy. And then Steve got into another gig that works out better for him. He's making um, a better living. So I, I stepped away from that completely, and now Steve's running the show over there, and he's managing um, he's managing several um, uh, rental facilities, and he's taking care he's taking care of those, and he's got his furniture business on the side now. So I've stepped away from that entirely, and I'm back to just designing and messing around in the garage, which. I think ultimately works out better for me. Yeah, it makes sense. It'd be hard to go back to like a schedule and a plan and you know having to deal with a lot of other people when you've gotten used to and enjoy just being by yourself and doing whatever you want when you want to do it. Yep. Yeah, and that's kind of and anybody that follows my channels know they, they see how sporadic things are. It's just it, it, I have a list of things I'd like to do that's as you know as long as my arm, but most of the time it's just hey I think of something on Monday and then. You know, Wednesday I go out and build it because that's what I want to do that day. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, speaking of having stuff to do, this is a good one. This is for both of us, um, and I'll, I'll take it first. At what point did you feel like you had enough content to justify a YouTube channel or a website? 
As someone who's interested in starting a channel, I'm afraid that I would not be able to present enough content to keep a viewership interested. Well, I know for me, um, I actually, at the beginning, I didn't plan ahead. I had a bunch of stuff that I would like to learn how to build or things I'd like to do, but I didn't really have a plan like, you know, here's ten projects, and that gives me enough content to get started. It was more like, well, i got to do one. Get it started, get it out there, and then the response to that motivated me to want to do more. And I was telling Izzy a minute ago that, and I've said this before, that one of the reasons that I started doing uh, my website was just to have a, a justification for spending time in the shop. You know, it was for, I have a family, so the time away from the family has to be justified to me. And um, so by having a, a vehicle to put some stuff out in a, in a teaching, you know, informational format, um, that was enough for me to justify the time in the shop. And once I started down that path, it was like, oh, yeah, well, I, I can teach about this thing. And, oh, oh, here's another thing that I know that I can teach. And it just kind of, the content kind of builds itself, I think. And now, just like Izzy, I've got a list that grows faster than I can get through it. And, and I, have, I have more projects than I will ever be able to do, I'm sure. You know, um, so, I don't know, what about you? The same, actually, when I started uh, this channel, I actually started my channel back in, uh, I want to say, 08, and I was just a, it was a, a, a it was just a uh, crutch, really. I was showing some of my furniture that I was designing to um, furniture companies, so I'd do a little video of my, of the pieces that I built, and I'd stick it up on there, and they'd be able to look at it, and then I took all that stuff down, and when I, uh, when I moved to Charleston and I started messing around with the idea of throwing up some videos just for some how-tos, just to share some ideas. It wasn't anything serious. And um, so I started doing that and it just, I never really planned it. It never, this was never meant to be anything huge. It was just, um, you know, pretty much sheer boredom just trying to, you know, get out there back in the woodworking community in some aspect so I could share some ideas, maybe get some feedback and make, meet some, make some friends, that sort of thing. And then, um, so I didn't really have a plan about having so much content to, to start a channel. I just started a channel and started throwing videos up. And if you go back and look at my first videos, don't do it, but <laughs> they're terrible. <laughs> you know, not, I'm not much better at it now, but I've gotten a little bit to that point where I can portray some energy in the videos. And uh, instead of just a single monotone, one camera angle, talking the whole time through explaining a system. So, you know, but... Uh, that's so I you know as far as answering the question I never really had a plan I never really had a, a goal in mind it was just yeah you know, I'm gonna throw this stuff up to you know see if anybody bites I guess yeah and I, I think there's you know it's like a lot of things where you you may have an idea of what you want to do with it before you get into it and then once you get in you realize you know say you say say you want to make a bunch of videos and you get into it you may realize that man video is just not the format for me to get my projects across you know Maybe it's maybe it's blog posts. Maybe photos and, and writing are the better way that I communicate what I'm trying to show, or vice versa. I mean, for me, I originally started wanting to have a blog, wanting to do these very detailed how-tos uh, with lots of photos and lots of in-depth instruction. And I found that to be so tedious in, in, compared, in comparison with making a video of the exact same thing. And so now I, I just found after doing it a little bit that video was a, a better fit for me. So that's just one example of you may get into it thinking you're going to do a certain type of project, and then once you get in there, realize that you need to do something else or you have a different take on it or you, you know, whatever. So I think trying to pre-plan too much before you start producing content is just going to slow you down. It's just going to stop you from getting to that point where you actually really truly know what you want to be doing and how you want to produce the stuff. You know, you just won't figure that out until you do it. So I would say, Clay, that um, if you're interested in starting one, find one project and do you know, do one post, one video of that project and then step back from it, see how it turned out, see what the response is and then adjust, you know, and go from there. <clears throat> so that's my yeah. uh, this is for both of us. Um, what would you recommend to a limited tools, limited space, no formal education in woodworking, but very interested in learning, and high expectations. <laughs> That's a lot. So what would we recommend to someone with little tools, little space, little education, but a lot of interest? 
do you have for that? Um, well, <laughs> I grew up in uh, a little background here briefly. I grew up around um, woodworking. I've been since since I could open my eyes and walk around, I've been in a shop or around it, and um, so I think that. Uh, let me let me change this up. When I first got started professionally in woodworking, I, I literally used a jigsaw, a screwdriver, or a hand drill, and um, I had a, a sander and a couple other things that I used. And I would make these. Um, it was I was 14, or you know, when I started actually building stuff to sell, um, and I would build these arbors out of you know maple, soft maple limbs I cut out of the woods, and I I started you know, doing these arbors and little benches and that sort of thing. And I mean, I, it was literally a hammer, uh, a hands, a handsaw and a drill. And um, I was making, <laughs> but a year into it, I was making more money than my mother was as a prison guard. So, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't need much to, to do what you want to do. You know, as far as limited space, you, you know, uh, you, you can work outside. It doesn't have to be in a shop, you know, and I think that's probably something that, that it would be nice to see more of here on YouTube. Everybody that's doing videos has got a shop. We have, we've all got, where most of us have band saws and, you know, table saws, which is still pretty basic tools, but it's more than a lot of people have, I think. And, you know, you don't have to have, if you've got a chisel, a hammer, and a handsaw, you can go out and build stuff, you know, and you don't have to have a bunch of money for materials. Go out in the woods and cut you know, maple limbs down. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can do, that can be done with almost nothing. So. Yeah, I would I would say the same thing. I mean, you can you can get away with very few tools, and you know, hand tools are one thing. But even if you want to power, you know, and start power tools, I mean, get a, a circular saw, and that can do just about everything that you can do with you know any of the other bigger saws. And as for working outside, I totally agree because that's how I started. When I started making videos, you can go back and watch all my old ones. I, w I didn't have a shop. I would have to take my table saw and everything out front, cut it all, clean it up, bring it back in, you know, and then if I mess something up, I have to do the whole thing over. So a 30-second cut was 10 minutes of out there, but that was the only way that I could get that stuff done, and it was worth it because, you know, it, it gave me enough um, perspective and enough interest to then say, okay, well, now I'm going to take my garage, which is you know, part of my house. It's not really a garage. And I'm going to, like, wall it off and turn it into a shop. But it was a progression. I didn't just start there. And I found something that I cared about, something that I worked up to, and I got there. And that's not just saying that you'll necessarily work up to a shop or that I'll ever work up to a bigger shop or anything like that. But, you know, uh, you got to start with what you have, and, and it'll progress. Or it'll change, like I said before, with the other stuff. I mean, you may realize that, you know, woodworking is not your thing. Maybe it's metal, or maybe vice versa, or whatever. But um, start with what you have and go from there. Okay. Um, this one's for Izzy. Do I remember correctly that you have a science background? Can you tell us more? <laughs> no, I didn't finish high school. <laughs> so um, I, I, uh, I quit work. I quit high school to, to build log homes for a guy up in Greenville, Michigan. And then uh, I went back and got my general education diploma. I took some courses and through college for uh, construction management, architecture. Uh, never finished, um, but no, 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 no real hard, solid, formal background training. Just an insatiable curiosity and a lot of reading. So, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, here's another one for you. You plan? Uh, you planning to make a crossbow powered by a drill? Are you planning yes. to use an existing one or completely build a new one? Completely build it. I, I would ha I have to build it from scratch because the internal mechanisms that I need to use to make the um, ram work to pull the string back and reload the whatever. I, I'm not. I'm just not going to shoot uh, bolts. I just am not going to step off that cliff. I'm not going to go there. Probably make it shoot something like paintballs or something like that. Um, I, I have to build it from scratch because a lot of the mechanisms are going to be internal. So nice. Uh, I can't wait to see that. That's going to be pretty interesting. It's going to be a fun one. I got it pretty much worked out, I think. So, have you started it, or it's worked out in your head? Oh, your head. So everything gets done up there before it gets before I start. I, I typically know what where, know exactly what I'm doing before I cut the first piece of wood. Nice. 
<laughs> okay, here's a good one for both of us. Don't you agree that woodworking is easier to understand than women are? I don't really have anything to say there. I just thought it was a funny question. <laughs> I have a Polish wife. She runs a tight ship. I'm not going to comment. <laughs> My wife is Polish as well. I didn't know that. Yeah, her family is Polish. Um, all right, so both of us. What do you do when you hit the wall with your creativity? Um, this one kind of came up in the last episode, um, in, or a previous episode of some sort. Hey, it was the last one. I asked, I asked the question in the last episode with you oh. and Mark. Yeah, that was okay. the last well, one. Because I have people ask me that, and I don't know how to answer it, because I don't. I never run into that problem. So. Oh, I was hoping you had an answer, because I was going to say the same thing. I, I don't have a problem with that, mainly because um, a lot of my stuff is not... Um, it, it's very functional. You know, It's filling a need. So like, I'll, I'll make something that fills a need that I have in my house, or somebody I know has a need, or something like that. So it's not like I'm just coming up with things that I don't need just to, for the sake of making stuff. You know, that happens on occasion, but and I think if I was doing that all the time, that would probably uh, I would hit that wall. But um, I guess if you do hit a wall, that may be a way to, to temporarily get around it. You know, is to just look for a need, look for something that's maybe not as creative, not, not as interesting uh, creatively, but something functional. You know, find oh, this thing in my house needs an extra shelf or whatever, go do that. Maybe that'll inspire you to do something more creative uh, in the long run. Um, but yeah, I don't personally run into that either. Yeah. Um, so for both of us, what is your process for figuring out how to build something once you have the idea? Do you sketch, build prototypes, models, and at what point do you call it done, assuming things can always be improved? Oh, it's Matt. Hey, Matt. Go ahead. Uh, I <laughs> that's a, that would be a difficult one for me to for me to answer as well because like I I, I said before I you know I, I don't know I, I build things in my head pretty you know that's just what I do and um, occasionally I do need to sketch something out if it's a fairly complicated system but it's just you know it, I do uh, just let me read that again here so I can make sure I'm answering this whole thing fully. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer it and then you, while you read it. So I, for me, I um, I started out um, when I first started doing these projects, trying to build uh, plans, and we were just talking about plans before this, and I found that uh, I had such a hard time or a frustrating time executing the plan to the precision that I could just do the thing. And so I found that it was better for me to spend time with one of these and just you know get get the rough idea, get the measurements down, and then execute the detail and the specifics when I'm actually building it. So somebody actually earlier, it's not in these questions, but somebody on YouTube earlier was asking me how I came up with the idea for making these notebooks like I did you know, in my recent video. And it was just that. I've been buying Field Notes notebooks that are like 4 or $5 a piece or something. I'm carrying them around in my pocket and they get all ragged and they get torn up and I burn through them really quickly. And finally I was like, why am I wasting money on these notebooks that look like everybody else's notebooks and whatever. So I'm going to be drawing in them anyway, so that's why I made them, because I always had one in my pocket, and I can make them cheaper than I can buy them. So, um, but yeah, I always sketch. Um, I don't really build prototypes unless there's something that I'm pretty sure can go wrong, which does happen on occasion, but um, usually the stuff doesn't require a prototype. What about you, Yes, um, when I'm building machines or my jigs, I, I typically don't have to sketch anything out, like I said, unless it's complicated systems. Uh, but for furniture, that's a different story. If I'm building, like a, a couple years ago, I designed a real lightweight Adirondack chair. When I'm doing something like that, I typically draw, I will draw, to work out all the, the, the angles and that sort of thing, I draw a full-scale uh, sketch of it. I'll get a piece of cardboard or um, hardboard or whatever laid out on my bench and I'll, I'll do a, a front view and a side view of it so I can kind of work out some of the details that way because uh, in that way, in that aspect it's a lot easier to kind of to, um, negotiate where the joinery is going to be and where some of the, the initial problems are going to be at. So that's that would be how I would go about designing it, like a chair or you know something that would be a little bit more tricky to build in, in the furniture world. So. Okay. Uh, here's one for you. Um, Izzy, you are an inspiration to all of us. Uh, who are your biggest inspirations in the woodworking field? In the woodworking field? Um, yeah. 
I, I'm a bit of a history buff, so I would have to say uh, the big, the, probably the two biggest names that come to mind when I when I think about, or three biggest names that come to mind are George George Nakashami, was an architect turn, born in the turn of the century. Uh, he's kind of the father of slab wood top furniture. Uh, his work has uh, always been really inspiring to me. I hope to own one of his pieces someday, but I'm going to have to save my pennies for a long time for that. Uh, Sam Muloff is another one. Uh, his, how he kind of stepped up, you know, he kind of stepped up the, the boundaries of chair making and what he does, and I really enjoyed his work. And there we still have a, a rustic artist named uh, Randy Holden who does. If you guys are watching this, and I take my look up elegantly twisted or um, yeah, elegantly twisted rustic furniture, and check out Randy's work, you will be blown away. Um, it, there is nothing else like it on the planet. It is it's some of the most incredible work you'll ever see. And um, I'm actually going to be introducing some people through my channel, um, some woodworkers that I find very inspiring. You know, um, as far as YouTube creators, though, I like, you know, uh, <laughs> Jimmy Durest is probably the guy. And I, I just, I really hadn't started watching his stuff until a few months ago, five months ago, I guess, six months ago. But uh, I, I, just the way he video. Just the way he does his videography, the whole aspect of it is art, what he's creating, what he's doing, you know, so in that I find what Jimmy does really inspiring. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of people I look up to, you know, as far as uh, woodworkers go, lots and lots of people that are just incredible. So. Yeah, I would agree. There's, there's almost too many to name. <laughs> yeah. and, and the cool thing is that they, um, they keep coming, you know, like, there's a lot of new people coming specifically to YouTube. We'll just talk about that for a second. There's a lot of people that are coming with new channels and do new projects, and a lot of them are, um, at, well, they're at all different levels of stuff, of, of quality and of you know style and, and all the, the different stuff. But I'm constantly amazed at how many new people create channels who are, like, ridiculously talented. Like, yeah. why didn't you have a channel showing off this work before now? You know, because yeah. I'm just I'm amazed. It's not you know, it's not like it's all uh, people who are just getting into it and trying to figure it all out. But people that mm -hmm. have been doing it for a really really long time and they're finally just being able to get it in front of a much wider audience, which is great for yeah. them. So I'm glad that that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a Turner I'm going to introduce in a couple of weeks named Derek Weedman who does off access turning that. Um, will knock your socks off. When I first saw it, it was incredible. I mean, I was like, he's not turning that, you know, that wasn't done on a lathe. It's absolutely insane. I actually got to see him do a live demonstration, and it's it's just crazy what, what some people, the imaginations that people have that express, you know, these new guys that are coming up onto YouTube, and not just YouTube, but in the, the YouTube is a very small part of what's, what goes on in the woodworking world. And I know it's the biggest part for a lot of people, but in the actual woodworking world, there's so much that happens. So you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of, if I can, kind of tow some of that in a little bit so other people can experience it and see it. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, Jimmy has a message for you. He says, big love, Izzy. I feel the same. So. <laughs> oh, man, Jimmy. And How actually, you doing, buddy? He has a question here for you, too. And um, okay. I, was, I was curious about this, too. Do you have any patents? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> I, You know, I... It, in, in, the, in the United States, or I don't know if it's anywhere else, but in the United States, it's so hard to protect intellectual rights. It's really difficult, and it's very expensive. So um, I've got two, or one actually, one other one that I'm working on. So I have one patent on a machine that I designed. It's an all-inclusive machine. I call it the shop in the box. It basically folds up into a box that you mount on a garage wall. It's got... Um, anything you'd need in it pretty much to, to build just about anything you could want. And um, it's, you know, a lot a, a lot different than, like, the shopsmith because everything is very accessible. You don't have to, there's not a lot of change up. It's just hit or miss, go. It works off of an articulating system. The major parts of it work off of a, a giant articulating system. And then I've got the other one. I actually did a video of a drill bit that drills corners, drills around corners and drills curved holes. And um, I, I, I perfected that, and I'm, I'm working on a patent for that. I, I don't know. I may have run into a bit of a bump. There's another design out there from the uh, 40s, 
40s where a gentleman used a, a similar idea but he uses a carriage system rather than mine it's just a, a kind of a free you know just do it kind of thing and that, that's all I've done beyond that it, it really is you know it, it's, it's so expensive to protect your ideas it, um, it's just you know to do to do a patent these days is anywhere between six and thirteen thousand dollars depending on you know what it is and who you're getting a patent with and that sort of thing so yeah yeah it's, I've had a couple ideas that people say I should patent but I'm just scared of that entire process I'm not entirely sure that it's worth it <laughs> so. well talk to me afterwards I can hook you up with a great guy but it's you know Again, you have to understand the patent office is full of insanely good ideas that never go anywhere. You got to, you know, you when you get into tool development, you got to think about the industry. Right now, the tool industry, they're not looking at new ideas. You know, uh, since the economy in 08, they just it's not been something they've been working on developing. So you're just not seeing any movement. You're not seeing a bunch of these new tools coming out, and um, you got to think about prototyping. For instance, the prototype that first machine I'm talking about is in the millions, and it's not something that will probably ever come to light. But you know, who knows? Maybe it will. We'll see. <laughs> well, speaking of jigs, here's another one. Um, which of all the jigs you've made is the one that you are most proud of? Uh. <laughs> I don't think I've shown that one yet. <laughs> so, um, I got, uh, I don't know, the ones that I've shown, I think the one I'm most proud of is the bowl making jig, the bowl blaster, you know, the one that scares everybody. Um, that one, I'm, I'm actually redesigning and redeveloping that uh, kind of slowly. I need to get motivated about that to work completely differently and to do some well, you, you'll have to see it, but it's it, it's I'm taking it to another level, taking it to another level, so it can do a lot of decorative work. It can not only do that, but turn plates and different instead of just being limited to the your basic circumference. Um, you know, they can do uh, different shaped parabolic planes, that sort of thing. So yeah. that's about it with the jigs. I don't, you know, it's a hard one. I love all my jigs, so. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you've done so many that it seems like it would be hard to um, say that one is you know more interesting than the other. I mean, I've been blown away at, at the variety of, of jigs that you've done. Uh, well, you know, it's hard because I mean, I like I said, I have a list as long as my arm of stuff that I want to do, and a lot of it is stuff that you know I, I don't know people just haven't seen before. So I'm looking forward to doing to doing some of those, but uh, it's just when and then once you put it up. Once you put up a system, you get a lot of people that are interested in it, and then you kind of feel obligated to provide people with an opportunity to to, to do that. And so, so you kind of, I've been kind of picking and choosing what I show and what I don't show, and there'll be more. There'll be really just there'll be some cool stuff. I promise. So. <laughs> well, I think you've already gotten a lot of cool stuff. I don't think people are <laughs> worried about that. Right. Um, all right. So we got another one here. Izzy, you make some lovely natural wood and accents on furniture. Did you learn to do this through trial and error, or did someone guide you in that style? Trial and error. Yeah, um, I grew up in the fine furniture world. Um, it wasn't rustic. It was all fine furniture. I've cut more hand cut dovetails than I ever care to imagine, and I hope to never cut one again. Um, <laughs> uh, the rustic, the rustic, the carving, and that sort of thing was all self-taught. Hmm. Is there was there a motivation for it? I mean, like, was there a, a place in your life or a part of your life that you know that that was a part of? Or? Yeah, I built like I mentioned earlier. I, I um, quit school to build log homes, and I think when I at that point in my life, I started seeing all this cool rustic stuff, and I loved it. I mean, it was very natural. It was bringing. You know, everybody, most people have heard it before, but bringing that natural world indoors and, you know, rather than kind of, you know, chopping it up and perfecting it into these flawless boards that were, you know, we used to build fine furniture with, we're, we're instead of trying to hide the imperfections, they're actually accentuating them and just showing that in its natural state. And that, that really appealed to me. I mean, that was, you know, when I started doing natural, doing, building more natural wood uh, stuff, it was... You know, it was a hack job at first. It was just something that I had to learn over time. And when I saw the um, the Adirondack style for the first time, the birch bark and, and twig mosaic, where you could just 
I mean, there were there's no limits, there's no boundaries there. You can just let your imagination go wild and crazy, and and I that just I mean that was like that just clicked. It instantly appealed to me. So, and that's kind of why I stayed in that genre and moved and designed a lot of furniture in that genre. And um, it's worked out well for me. It's it's you know it's definitely a niche niche type of furniture, but it's something that I enjoy. Yeah, I mean, really, all furniture is kind of a niche, you know. I mean, the stuff that that, that appeals, the people that that appeals to, um, the finer stuff may not, and vice versa. So I think right. exactly. what style you're in, you're still going to have a fairly limited, you know, audience. But it's, I guess whatever you're better at and enjoy making more is probably the thing that you should be doing. <laughs> yeah, I still do some fine furniture from time to time. Um, chairs, I, I love chairs, uh, but. As far I don't, as far as fine furniture, I don't get into cabinets or anything like that anymore, and uh, it's a very rare thing for me to to, to actually build uh, to sit down and build a piece of, you know, I, I use the term fine furniture just to, you know to describe it as, you know, something that's not rustic. So. Um. So do you do? It, when you do fine furniture, is it is it usually like commission stuff? Do you do a lot of commission work for people these days? Um, I, I have a few people who I still build commission work for, but there's a small, it's a small list, and if somebody, you know, um, just people I've developed relationships with over the years that I would consider friends now, um, that I will still build for, um, uh, but as far as, like, commission work outside of that, I, I don't, bother, I don't, I just don't have time for it, you know, I've got so many irons in the fire and a family to raise, so it just, it becomes, uh, it becomes more of a, a, a problem than a, than a, than a blessing. Yeah, I I started um, I don't know, earlier in the years. I took on a lot of custom uh, builds for people, and I found mm -hmm. really quickly that it was wearing me out. Not not the actual building, but just the keeping up with you know what people want. You know, are they happy with it? Is it meeting exactly what they asked for? And I found that I was like losing the interest in actually building the thing because I was too worried about you know uh, kind of their response to it. Yeah, and so since then I've backed off a lot on on trying. To, you know, if somebody asks me, a close friend asks me to build something, that's one thing. But I'm not going to go looking for custom work anymore because it's just it's not what I want to be, be doing right now. Um, yeah, the furniture furniture world is a multi multifaceted world. It, it it brings into play a lot of things, and it's really a it's a difficult business. So yeah, uh, David uh, Drunken Woodworker showed up. Joining hey, me. buddy. I'm sorry. But he heard that you made some pieces for a celebrity or two. Can you talk about that? Um, I won't mention the celebrities' names, but yes, I built furniture for two different celebrities, and I, I um, yeah, it was in the rustic genre, upstate New York area, and that they both enjoyed, enjoyed, enjoyed it. And I will tell you this: I'll tell you a quick story. One of the celebrities um, came into the the gallery the, at a shop behind a gallery up in Jeffersonville. And I had no idea who it was. <laughs> uh, they came in and um, and talked and talked and told me what they wanted and everything. And when the, the gallery owner came in after they had left, all excited, and I had absolutely no idea that it was a celebrity. So that was kind of a cute story. But um, <laughs> I, yeah, so now you're making us even more curious as to who it was. Yeah, it's it's well, not you know, not going to talk about it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, here's another one for you. Uh, you have a rather deep fixation with drill-powered projects. If funding and time were no object, do you have an ultimate, absolutely mind-blowing drill-powered project that you'd just love to create? I think that, I don't know if I would call it mind-blowing, but the premise of being able to take one drill and have everything that you need in a shop, um, let's say we'll call it a mini station that, that's powered, everything's powered by a drill, I, I think I would love to do that. I would think, you know, have a little, uh, maybe a 10-inch band saw that's powered by a drill, have a little table saw with, um, you'd, have to, you'd have to have a, a gear increase to, to get the speeds you need, but you could definitely do that. So you could have a little table saw that runs off of that. You know, I mean, just a whole system, lathe, you know, just everything that you could want in a small little roll-away cart that you could stick in your garage. I think that would be really cool. You know, and as far as you know, the drill fix the fixation that that's not really true. It just kind of ended up that I did a couple of jigs with drill powers, and the reason I did that is because they're they're accessible all over the world to everybody. You know, there's very few places in the world where you can't get a hand drill. So, um, and there's a lot of places where you can't get 
a scroll saw or even a band saw or that sort of thing. So my thought was, well, if everybody's got a drill, I can show them how to build, you know, something that the drill does and the, the, that, you know, solves a problem for them with something as simple as a drill. So and that's kind of where that started. And it just, it kind of, you know, the feedback was everybody was, you know, thinking it was cool. So it just kind of kept going with the drill. And I've got some more fun drill builds coming up. So we'll be playing with that again in the future. But I think having a little workstation that you could power with one drill would be cool. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, the drill makes sense because, you know, you the, the fact that you've used it on several things makes sense because you found a high-speed, really small motor that you can plug in and you can use it. You know, it's easy to attach to just about anything. So I can yeah. see that not being a fixation just as much as like, hey, this is really easy and handy and, you know, makes well, sense. It's Right, it's about making it accessible. Um, I can build some really complicated systems. Then you know it's cool what they do, but then it's not accessible for a lot of people to build. So it doesn't make sense to do that. You know, it's a lot easier to keep. I wouldn't say it easier. Sometimes it's difficult to build simpler, but to build things as simple as possible to make them more accessible for everybody, I think is kind of what my goal is with most of what I do. Okay, well that brings up an interesting thing that I was. I think about this for myself a lot, so I'm curious, you know, what you think about it. Um, do you produce the projects that you do and the content that you do for the sake of teaching those specific things to people, or are you trying to teach them the mechanics, or are you trying, you know, is there something else about it? Is it the thing, or is it something about the thing? Does that make sense? It. I think the underlying tone of my channel, what I'm trying to get across is that there's so much this, you know, woodworking, you, you, you'll hear some people say that, you know, I can't teach anything new in woodworking, all I can do is, you know, show somebody something that's already been taught and maybe in a different way. I, I don't agree with that, um, I think because, you know, there's so much that has, we, we've, we've got a long way to go yet, we're going to develop some crazy things in the future, but, so I, I'm trying to get people to think. Is that's what you know? Why my show's called Think Woodworks? Um, you know, my one of my I have a my favorite quote of all time is from Socrates, and it, and it simply says, um, "I cannot teach anyone anything. I can only inspire them to think." So the idea is, if I show people different ways of accomplishing tasks that they may already you know do with uh, in certain ways, or maybe a new task to do in a different way. Um, that it'll it'll get their wheels turning, and I, I you probably know this. If you get into a project where you're where you're really involved in something and you're designing uh, uh, something new, it leads to other things. You, it leads to other ideas. You say, hey, I could use this in this in this application over here. Um, so if, if people start kind of, if I can get people interested in you know uh, working on things like that, that kind of challenge them, kind of frustrate them a little bit because. You know, frustration is a, is a really good learning tool. Um, it it kind of helps, I don't know, gets the, greases the brain wheel, so to speak, and, um, you know, gets people thinking and say, how can I solve an issue? How can I solve this problem in, an, in a, another way? So and I think that's probably the underlying, I try to portray that with my channel. That's kind of the underlying tone is to motivate people to think, not necessarily give them all the information, but definitely give them a lot of information. Um, but enough that they can see what's going on, and I hope to in inspire people to, to kind of, ex you know, head, head, you know, head, uh, take the challenges head on, and kind of just you know to de develop ideas and new ways, and to kind of think outside the box a little bit. You know, if you don't have a bandsaw, how can I get around that? If I don't have a, um, or if I need to accomplish a, a task that, you know, how can I build a jig or a system that'll make this easier for me, especially if it's something I'm going to do a lot of. So that's that's kind of where I, I, I hope to go with the channel. So hmm. that's, that's really cool. I You know, I've known that you and I have a lot of the same uh, focus, but we do very different things, you know, but it's really interesting to hear you say that because one of the things that I've uh, narrowed my focus over the last nine months or so is, is not necessarily about teaching people how to do a thing, like, you know, the notebooks. That That's something that a lot of people look at, or, you know, the zip line. The zip line's a really good example. Um, mm -hmm. People look at that and go, I don't have kids. I don't need a zip line. That's dumb. And I got a lot of that type of response. <laughs> but the point was not to make a zip line. It was to show you that you don't need a lot of stuff 
and it doesn't take any special skill, but you can, you know, you can make a space more interesting by doing something in it. So I've narrowed my focus a lot um, to show people the full, you know, every detail of a project, start to finish, super fast, whatever. I show them the whole thing, not so that they understand every single piece of it, but so that they can see the entire process and step back from it and be like, oh, well, that's not really that hard because I saw him right. do all of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I hope that comes across. But that type of, and what we're both talking about, like with our, our focus and what we're trying to get across to people, it would be really interesting to hear from people about what they think we're trying to do. And, and this goes for all, all people who are creating content, YouTube, otherwise, whatever. I think it would be really interesting for people to take a sampling of their audience um, and to find out what the audience thinks they're trying to accomplish with their projects. You know, it, 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 it may be like totally off, but they're still getting something out of it, and that's fine. You know, it doesn't really matter. But um, that's one thing I like to really talk to other content creators about because I love to know like why they're doing what they're doing. It's usually not just because I want to make some shelves or whatever. You know, there's usually something else to it, and that, that's really interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that's that's really the bottom line here uh, uh, for me, especially is to um, maybe uh, you know as humbly. I mean, uh, how do I do it? <coughs> to to inspire people, I want to I want to inspire people to, to to solve problems, to think for themselves, to create solutions to you know to the, the challenges that they face. I guess. Yeah, and I would have said it the exact same way. So and that's awesome that we're both. <laughs> Teach and trying to inspire problem solving. That's great. Um, yeah. Here's one from Mike. Uh, both. Where do you think this resurgence of woodworking DIY making will go? Custom built versus manufactured. I personally, <clears throat> I'm I'm immersed in this culture of making, and I have been for a long time in a lot of different uh, capacity and you know a lot of different levels of interest. But I think that there's nowhere specific it's going as far as changing um, the larger like production systems that are out there for producing you know the things that we use every day or whatever I don't think that's those systems are really going to go away what I think is going to change and is changing already is people's understanding that things the things they use on a daily basis are not as complex as they really thought when you find out that you can buy a machine to help you make a thing that you that was previously only, you know, came in a box, no matter what that thing is, when you find out that you can get a tool to help you make that same thing for less money, that's empowering because then you have a better understanding of what, you know, how, how things are made and then you start to look at the stuff around you in a different light. You start to be able to dissect things and value things differently because you know that, well, this phone is, is actually worth the amount of money because that's not something I can do in my house. You know, that's not something I can do with a bandsaw. But uh, this furniture has a different value to me because I can I can actually figure out how to do something like that myself. So I, I don't think it's going to change things at a really large production scale, personally. And, and maybe it will. Hopefully it does. But I think, if anything, it's going to change people's perspective on the stuff that they have and hopefully open them up to... Um, to realizing that it doesn't take much to be more hands-on to be able to create your own stuff or improve your own stuff or whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't know. What do you think about where all this is going? Well, uh, first of all, I, I hesitate to use the word reinsurg reinsurgence of, of makers. Makers uh, is, Making is nothing new. Um, I, I think what it is now is it's a lot more public with the, uh, you know, with the Internet, with YouTube, and with what's going on. But I come from... I come from a fifth generation makers. I mean, we've always built and done what we needed to do to get our jobs done. You know, so making is is uh, is it's a uh, it's heritage. It's an, it's our you know it's our it's our country's heritage. We come from a long line of people who have always been makers. But I think now with you know there's so much information available to people now. Um, it's like our kids these days are smarter than they were when I was a kid because and it's true because there's just all that information that's available now. And I think that um, as far as, you know, teaching, teaching I, I teach my ch children critical thinking, and I teach them also 
that like Bob was just saying, it's so much it's so important, I think, to be able to to build something that you need rather than to just go out and buy it. Now like you were like you were just saying, there's you know, there's things you can't make. Um, but uh, for me I think that uh, as far as how is it going to affect manufacturing in the future, I, I don't see it affecting manufacturing as much as, as some people say. Um, coming from the manufacturing world, there's still things that people are going to buy. Uh, there's still things that, you know, people are going to buy um, couches, they're going to buy TVs, they're going to buy, you know, it's just it's not going to affect manufacturing as much as we think it are. But I think what it will do is empower people to. Um, to solve a lot more of their own problems rather than having to go look outside of that, look outside, look outside of themselves to, to solve an issue. Yeah, and, and another thought on that, as far as the manufacturing part, I, I, I think I agree with you. At a large scale, it's, I don't think it's going to have a big impact. Where it does have an impact on manufacturing, I think, is at the small scale. When um, you know people see a business opportunity in something that they can, they figure out that they can make something, or they get an idea and realize that I can actually produce this thing myself. Yeah. When they see that as a realistic option, then starting a business to produce a thing seems way more plausible than like, okay, well, what's the production change of getting a chain of getting things produced in China? And, you know, like the whole manufacturing process at that huge scale, I wouldn't go near that. I mean, I'm scared to death of that. I've thought about it before, but that just that sounds like a black hole to me. And But knowing that I can use my CNC machine and replicate something or a 3D printer and I can replicate some thing idea that I have, you know, at small scale production, that makes it to where, yeah, I could start a business making this little thing. And it may not be a worldwide business, but I can make some money, I can make a living, you know. So I guess from manufacturing, it, it is empowering, it has potential to empower small business or even medium business or, you know, the kickstarting of, of a business at a small level or something. So. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I just hope that people see that opportunity and are willing to um, take a step toward it. You know, because it's it, because it's so much more accessible than it used to be as far as producing something. So hopefully people will take advantage of what's there. Um, let's see. There's one here about um, oh yeah, to both of us. What do you do for a living? And have you thought about making projects and selling them on your Facebook page or something? And two, do you watch John Peters' channel? And Bob, will you invite him in the future? He's really skilled. Um, I have seen a few of his videos, and I have a, had a lot of people ask me to invite him. So I imagine that will happen at some point. Um, of course, when I invite somebody, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll come on the show. But you know, I've had good luck so far. Um, as far as what we do for a living, I am a uh, software developer, and I get to work from home, which is cool, and so my office is on the other side of this shop wall, so I get to work over there, and then when I take a break, I come over here and do stuff, and I go back to work. <laughs> um, so that's nice. It's also really distracting, but I, I'm actually pretty disciplined at doing my work. Yeah. Um, and you don't do anything for a living, <laughs> do you? Not really. Um, I, I, that's not necessarily true. Uh, I, I still make a living, but it's not. It's not a. I don't. I don't consider it work. Um, I design furniture uh, for a couple companies. Um, I, you know, I I collect a royalty on my designs, um, and I, I don't do a lot of that. Uh, I might design five or ten pieces a year. I'm actually actually now I'm in the middle of designing a new an entire new line. I'm calling it the uh, the uh, cotton mill collection. Um, that'll be available in oh I don't know five or six months. Um, aside from that, I you know, I, do, I don't do much. Um, I sold a business that I did real well at, and uh, I, now I just mostly play, make, try to make videos and play with my kids, and um, you know, just design furniture. And I have I've always got a little iron in the fire somewhere, but um, I, I try to minimize my responsibilities. I like to I like to have as much time as I can to spend with my family and my kids. So. Yeah, but I, I would definitely say that you, you have a lot to do. <laughs> and, and I have a lot to do as well, but I think we put that on ourselves. I mean, that's how we live yeah. our, you know, that's how we yeah. use our time. It's self-inflicted for sure. Yeah, no doubt. 
Um, so we got about ten more minutes. Um, if you guys have any other, there's still some questions left. But if you have any other questions that you've been wanting to get in, um, we I do usually try to cap it off right at an hour. So you know, make sure you get the questions in there so I can get to them if we need to. Um, there's one, another one here from Phil, and uh, basically he's asking if. I mean, if he has to make something more than one time, he feels like it's a chore rather than a hobby. So do we build things conveyor belt style or one-offs? What about you? Uh, I haven't built production in... Hi, Phil. By the way, I want to say hi. Phil's been with me from the start. He's a great guy. Comments in a lot of videos. So, Phil, thank you for doing that. Um, I, uh, As far as production goes... Um, you know, I had a little stint with the Pallet Pal. I thought that was a fun idea with the reclaimed oak handles, and I wanted to, to do something with that. But, it, you know, I, I put those up, and the, the, the response was insanely overwhelming. And I, I managed to build a whole bunch of them in a couple weeks, and then I pulled in some help, and, you know, then I just started having uh, issues with those, with, you know, the help and everything else. So I, I cut it off, and they won't be coming back. But... Um, as far as doing production, I'm I'm done with it. I'm, I'm a one-off guy, you know. I'll I'll build a jig or a piece of furniture one time, and that's that's all I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about doing the custom stuff for people. I I had a few um, a few events that I got asked to build, you know, multiples of a thing for, like these benches. I, I did a video on one of my benches, and I ended up having to make four of those ben benches. And the design the top design was different, but the construction was the same. And they were simple and fast and everything, but by the time I got through four of them, I was like, I don't ever want to build another bench in my life. You know, it was just it was just too much of the same thing. And um, I've done a, a few other things over the last year or so where I've tried to find a simple production thing that I could sell just to make some extra cash, and it's just, no matter what cash I'm making from it, it's just not really worth, you know, it, it, it's like a mental boredom. So for me, I, I just, uh, yeah, I have a really hard time doing anything more than once or twice. And it, it also is part of the fact that, you know, you're probably the same way, where you have this list of stuff that you want to do and you want to get to, and by having to do a project two, or three, four times, that's time that you're not spending eating away at that list of projects, you know. So that's, there's a frustration that comes into that for me, that, you know, it's like, I don't want to build another you know, bench or another tray or whatever. I want to go do this other thing I haven't gotten to do yet. So. Yeah. I feel the same way. I think one of the things that I do uh, personally to motiv motivate myself to get back to a project is to add something new to it. If I, if I try to make it interesting for me, then, then I'll, I'll be a lot more apt to get back to it or to read, to do it in a new way or do it with, a, you know, a different style or something. I, I have to add something to make it, you know, interesting for me to go back to. Yeah. Um, somebody says, please say hello for Brazil. Hello, Brazil. <laughs> I've been to Brazil. Brazil is amazing. Have you? I have. I went for a wedding years ago. I went to um, Rio and um, Fortaleza. So if Leo knows where uh, Fortaleza is, it's beautiful. It's on the beach. Anyway, I love Brazil. Um, so here's one for you. How's your back? And has it affected what you do in the shop? Yes, uh, it does affect what I do. It can, it will continue to do so. I crushed my back in a uh, car accident, um, oh, many years ago, and uh, at the time I, I crushed six vertebrae. Three of them are fake. My back's made out of metal. Um, so as I get older, I've, and then to add to it, I was a power lifter for a good number of years, and so that's caused some problems as well. Uh, and little things now, like a simple fall, like I, I hurt my back a while back. I was carrying my daughter out of the bathroom and tripped over one of her toys, and I did the tuck and roll so she wouldn't get hurt and landed landed on landed on one of her toys, on, on where where I have the problem, and that that caused some pretty serious issues. And I'm just now getting back to where I can move around pretty good from that. But in my shop, you, what you guys don't see, you see the energy and the moving around. What you don't see is that. I'm sitting down in between most of the vid most of the takes, and a lot of my stuff is spent spent sitting down on my big orange chair in front of my um, my bench bench there, um, organizing everything. So it's a problem, but I you know I do the best I can with it. 
Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're back uh, getting around, though. I mean, I'm glad yeah. it didn't you know, really take you out permanently, for sure. Yeah. Um, so we got about five more minutes, so if you've got any other questions, go ahead and send them in. we got a few more here. Um, let's see. Any opinions on tool reviews you see in the woodworking blogs and magazines? I, I assume this is just asking, like, what we think about people doing tool reviews. I personally, um, hmm, well, I, I, they have value because people need to know if a tool is worth getting or not. Um, I think often tool reviews that are in magazines and sometimes in videos are really advertisements in disguise, maybe, maybe not intentionally, but I think usually if someone is willing to do a tool review, um, it's because they are associated with the tool manufacturer or they're trying to be associated with the tool manufacturer. I'm saying that um, as someone who has only done one tool review, and it's for a, a company that I really like. It was from my CNC machine. I did a video on my CNC. And at the time, I was doing that purely because people were asking me about it. And I really, you know, I enjoy the machine and I enjoy the company. I, I, really, I really want to support that company because I think what they're doing makes a lot of sense. Um, and it was funny because I did that not planning, you know, I started working on it, it took a couple weeks to get the video finished and all this stuff. And in that time, I, uh, that, uh, after I'd shot it, I found out I had to go to Chicago for my day job. And the company is actually based in Chicago. So I was like, well, I'm going to be up there for an extra day. I should call them and see if I can go in. Then I got to go in and do an interview with them and meet them and see their space and everything. And so that's one of those cases where I didn't do the tool review because I was trying to get something out of the company, but I know it probably looks like that after the fact because I had the tool review and then I had an interview with them and a tour of their thing, like the next video. So I can't justifiably say that all tool reviews are, um, you know, based on somebody trying to sell for the company, but I think a lot of them are. They still have value. Um, I don't know. You gotta, you just kind of got to take them with a grain of salt. Do you have any opinion on this? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, how do I, I'm trying to approach this delicately? Um, there are certain things out there that I think are important for people to have. You need you need to have a chop box, you know, if you're going to build furniture professionally, or if you want to do. There's certain things that you have to have. You, I mean, you have to have a bandsaw, you have to have a, a chop box if if you need those for what you're doing, and to be able to go and you know, see which ones are better than others. Um, you know, I think that's important. To, you know, I have a certain set of tools that I've always gone to and always use, and uh, just because I, I know them, I know the companies, I know that, and they work well for me. But as far as uh, how I feel about tool reviews, I don't know really. It would be an unfair question for me to answer because I don't watch them. I don't really pay much heed. Um, I, I, you know... I, I wouldn't know how to, I really wouldn't know, you know, honestly what would be a good answer for that just to say that I, I, I have tools that I've always used and um, those are the kind of the, the tools that I tend to stick with, so. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it is a hard thing being at least in the position that we're in because we're trying to figure out, or I'll speak for myself, I'll speak for you. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to make this, this content sustainable, right? So I'm trying to figure out how to make it pay for itself and not to make a living from it necessarily or make a bunch of money off of it or anything like that, but for it to pay for itself. And one of the ways that a lot of people do that is to get, um, is to do tool reviews from companies that are that are they're not they're not reviews, they're ads, right? And some people just do reviews, so don't get me wrong. But it, it's a tough place to be in because you want to be able to justify, you know, you want to be able to recoup some of the cost um, and justify the money that you're putting into this content production and stuff like that. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's just one of those touchy things. Everybody has a different opinion on it. And both uh, as a viewer and as a creator, you know, or an author or whatever, everybody's going to have a little bit of different opinion on why they're doing it or why someone else is doing it or whatever. So, no good answer. Yeah. But here's a one good last question because it's 10:30. This is for both of us, from Mike. Uh, does a beard help with woodworking? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would agree. That's yes is my answer as well. No. All right. Well, um, guys, thank you so much for your questions and for hanging out. And of course, Izzy, thank you so much for doing this and for spending the time. I really appreciate it. And everybody is excited about what you have coming up. Is there anything you want to tell everybody about? Anything specific coming up or anything? Uh, you know, we got some fun stuff planned with the channel, and I'm trying to uh, make it more. I don't know what to say. I make it more, make it better for the viewers, and I'm, I'm going to try and do some new stuff here. And always, I, I love the feedback. Let me know what you guys are thinking, you know, what I'm doing. I definitely want to send a shout-out to Jimmy, uh, personal hero. So, Jimmy, thank you, man. It was a real honor for you to have you here watching, and I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, just keep watching. Uh, I promise to keep uh, putting this crazy content up there. And, I'm, you know, uh, one thing I did want to mention is that I, I plan on doing some longer videos once or twice a month of how-to tutorials, uh, really in-depth, the kind that really... You know, don't get a lot of views uh, just because they're they're long and boring. It's all te a lot of technical stuff. So I'll be doing more of that because I, I know some viewers had asked. So that's it. Cool. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it, and thank you everybody for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, the next episode of this show is I don't have the date in front of me. It's November something, um, but the guest is going to be Frank Howarth. And I'm really excited about that. Oh, rock on, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited uh, that he was willing to do it. So I'll post the date um, and when that's going to be. It's it's three weeks from tonight, whatever the date is for that. So I'll post that, and um, I have guests lined up through January, um, some really awesome people, and I'm really excited. And I wish I could just tell you the whole list, but i got to keep you in suspense. So thanks for watching, guys. Thanks, Izzy, and we'll see you next time.